when you do philosophy, you always have to have this double think, right? Uh, to do it, to write it, you got to think you're right. Or at least your idea is a good idea. On the other hand, at the same time, if you're thinking about problems like free will and possibility and necessity and truth, uh, another part of your mind is saying, hey, come on, Perry. Aristotle thought about this. Plato thought about this. Hume thought about this. Kant thought about this. Wes Holiday thinks about it. He's a hell of a lot brighter than you are. Kaplan thought about it. Uh, probably still is thinking about it. David Lewis thought about it. What are the chances that you've got something right that those geniuses had wrong? Zero. <laughs> well, so when you sit down to write your essay, you have to take that part of your belief system and put it on the shelf because you, you kind of got to believe that you're onto something to write philosophy. Hello, my geeselings. This is Mother Goose, Robinson Earhart, here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast, number 91. And this episode is with John Perry, who is Henry Waldgrave Stewart, Professor of Philosophy Emeritus at Stanford University. And John has worked in all sorts of areas of philosophy over his storied career, including the philosophy of language, mind, uh, metaphysics, he's done logic, uh, but he's He's also very well known for his famous slingshot argument with John Barwise, a, a longtime collaborator of his. And though there are so many aspects of John's philosophical work to touch on, we first talk about his book, The Art of Procrastination, which is not so philosophical as practical. And it is a guide to effective dawdling, lollygagging, and postponing. And in the course of our discussion, I realized that maybe I procrastinate a lot more than I think I do, or thought I did. I knew I procrastinated, but uh, now I'm realizing I'm a structured procrastinator the way that John is. So we then turn to the actual philosophical content of the episode, which is John's work on identity personal identity, and the self. And without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with John. I was surprised in preparing for our conversation to discover that you're not only an esteemed philosopher who's contributed to many areas of the discipline, but also a humor writer and <laughs> as something of an anti-productivity guru, if I could uh, call you that. And yeah. despite the fact that this is something of an academic podcast, I've decided that it's not too late to dip our toes into self-help. So how did your book, The Art of Procrastination, get started? Well, it was, um, I didn't exactly plan to write a book. I was just uh, uh, in, in, a, in a place I had to work, uh, a study um, one afternoon years ago at Stanford. And I had uh, papers to grade. I think the dean wanted me to write a memo about something. I don't know. Probably I was chairman of something. I almost always was. <laughs> and I was sitting there and and uh, not doing any of it, doing crossword puzzles. And it occurred to me, you know, what? Why am Why am I doing this? I mean, uh, what? What a complete procrastinator I am. This is shameful. Then it occurred to me that well, you know, the funny thing is though that I'm considered a, a productive person at Stanford. I'm considered a go-to person. That's why they keep appointing me to chair things and shit like that. <laughs> so it, it seemed like kind of a puzzle. So rather than do any, any of the things I was supposed to do, I thought about the puzzle <laughs> and uh, came up with the concept of structured procrastination, which is um, uh, if you're a procrastinator, you don't need to be a complete loser. All you have to do is figure out that you should get things you, you should you should procrastinate the most important thing you have to do by doing less important things 
and that, uh, oddly enough, that seemed to be what I do all my life, and um, it seems to work out pretty well. Of course, occasionally you have to give up and do the thing you're supposed to do, but you know, nine times out of ten, it disappears. The dean dies, or gets interested in something else, or uh, <laughs> anyway. So I wrote a short essay about it and showed it to a couple of friends, and one of them without my permission, sent it somewhere. I forget where. Uh, maybe some, uh, I don't know, some some academic place. And so that was that. Then a couple of years later, uh, I won the Ig Nobel Prize. And what is that? <laughs> I, this is what I saw. I saw this for the first time in your book. Yeah. Well, I like, I like to say it's just like the Nobel Prize, but doesn't pay as much. But the Ig Nobel Prize is a is a prize for for um, how does the guy put it uh, uh, something that's funny but still makes a contribution. Basically, I don't know. I can't even remember the guy's name. But it's it's a it's an ongoing thing, and there's Ig Nobel Prize winners, and it's it doesn't pay any money at all. But there there is a there is a thing back at Harvard where they award the Ig Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it. And then out of nowhere, I got a letter from a, a, an agent, a New York agent. Now, if you're in California and you're a writer, New York agent is kind of, ooh. You know? Yeah. And a guy named Barney Carpfinger. And he says, I read your Ig Nobel Prize winning uh, essay. I think it's great. You should turn it into a short book and I'll get it published for you. Well, <laughs> I couldn't resist that. So I turned it into a short book and he got it published at Workman, which is, you know, not an academic publisher, a popular publisher. And, and it, it sold very well. It was uh, on the New York Times bestseller list, not top 10, but top 20 for a couple of weeks. That's pretty cool. It was cool. I made enough money to help send my, I have 10 grandchildren, helps send, send some of them through college. So, Oh, that's awesome. Have but, you heard of Microcosmographia Academica? Uh, no. <laughs> it's, a, it's another academic humorous book, short book from maybe 100 years ago or something like that. Oh, but really? anyway, it's, a, it's, it's quite good. But so can you say more about what structured procrastination is beyond is, I mean, is there more nuance to it other than just do the most important thing last? Is there actual, is there actually like a, a technique to it? Well, there's a, yeah, there's a few things I come up with. Uh, I mean, I had to turn it into a book. Uh, uh, what, one thing is, um, uh, uh, well, let's see. What what do I do in the book? We must have it right around here somewhere. <laughs> I'll bring you a copy next time I come on canvas. But you know, basically, how not to feel guilty about it. Uh, how to what to do when uh, uh, push comes to shove and you actually have to finish the thing at the top of the list. Um, how to interact with your colleagues so they don't think of you as a complete loser. Uh, <laughs> And, um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, nothing goes much further than the basic idea, but an enormous number of people have written me and think, wow, that's just what I am, a structured procrastinator. And now if I've read your book, it changed my life. I don't feel so bad about it. So <laughs> it's funny how it goes against the the popular advice and what I'm thinking of is this book called Eat That Frog, where the idea is the the first thing you're supposed to do is the most important thing. Like first oh. thing in the day, you eat that frog and you do the most productive thing. Well, I, I kind of try to do that. Some people. Do you do that? Well, it depends on what you view as the most important thing. So, I mean, I, I take my dog out for a long walk mm. <laughs> first thing in the morning. That to me is pretty important, but I put my taxes off until like 30 minutes before they're due. Well, that sounds like you're a structured procrastinator, but you found another, another name for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Possibly. Re revalue your values so that 
<laughs> so you don't have to structure procrastinate. You just start at the top of your list, but the list is totally revised from an ordinary person's list. I like yeah. that. Yeah, that's true. Uh, maybe that is what I've done. Uh, that's but, not a dog. That's a cat. I don't. Want to, I hate to break it to you. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is pins. She's the the pod cat. Actually, since this is a podcast, um, the dog is on the bed just watching. The dog and the cat get along. They do. They do. Good. Now, a last sort sort of meta philosophical question, I guess, before we get to personal identity. Yeah. <laughs> you've also beyond this uh, humorous writing, you've also written a lot of dialogues. Well, and three of them, I guess. Yeah, three's a lot. Three's a lot more, and I mean they're they're short book length. But yeah. how do you feel about since you've been around philosophy for a while, the current trend in the way arguments are presented in the community, which is typically through articles that more and more resemble science articles rather than say essays mm-hmm. or let alone dialogues and other more creative or engaging ways of presentation. Well, I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, uh, do I have objective reasons for that? Or is it just because I'm old and used to doing the way things I was taught or came, came to do? Well, probably mostly the latter. But um, if if you mean my, I mean, I had a student, undergraduate student there a, a long time ago, Wes Holiday. Oh, great student. Yeah, great student great, to have. Great guy, wrote some really good stuff, uh, wrote an honors thesis on, I forget what it was, but it uh, wasn't logic. And um, then he, he stayed around as a graduate student and started working on modal logic. And he told me how much he loves modal logic because unlike the kind of philosophy he's doing with me, you prove things. And that's so satisfying. Well... <laughs> Uh, I think that was a great loss to philosophy when Wes got into modal logic. Uh, uh, I mean, granted, you don't prove things in philosophy. Maybe, maybe occasionally do, but you give your best arguments. You try to explain some things that are confusing. You try to develop language that works or try to understand why the language we have works. And it's a much different enterprise. But, um, and I... I don't. I don't have anything against logic. I do have something sort of against modal logic, and that I don't understand possible worlds. Um, but uh, an example of the way I like it more is a book I wrote with John Barwise called "Situations and Attitudes," because uh, he was a very gifted and important logician. But kind of, we start off not assuming a logic or even philosophy of language, but just thinking about the world, or as I would prefer to say the universe, because often by the world, we mean the earth. And (laughs) it's not very big. I mean, Mm -hmm. the universe has got at least a trillion galaxies, they tell us. So, (laughs) So the idea of a possible world is having all the possibilities that the world has, and then all the other ways they could have turned out. That's really huge. Um, and and Barweiss and I couldn't see it. We thought the notion that made sense for human beings was situations. Stuff goes on, and then it goes on in a region of space and time. And, uh, you know, uh, what what concerns a given animal may be relatively uh, limited in space and time. Uh, By the time we get to humans, we've got, you know, all kinds of interests. And then one thing we expect is if if a proposition is true in virtue of what happens in a given situation, it should be true in virtue of what happens in any larger situation of which that situation is a part. And if you just have that principle of persistence, uh, you you get uh, versions of your laws of logic. So, uh, but at any rate, metaphysics uh, you know doesn't have to just be touchy feely. It doesn't have to sound like Sartre or Heidegger, but uh, still, you, that's where you got to start. 
Uh, and um, uh, so, so I just think too much philosophy is, I don't want to say pseudo logic, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it, you take all the stuff we think we've learned about necessity from modal logic. Um, Quine didn't think necessity made much sense. And a lot of people tended to think he was right. And I think a lot of good work was done on intentionality and stuff. Then, then um, Kripke and Lewis came along and said, hey, here's how to think of it. And Stalnicker, too. Here's how to think of it. Uh, 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 poss something is possible if it's true in some possible world. And then Kripke showed us how to quantify over possible worlds. Uh, and to bring in this accessibility relation, and uh, the privacy accessibility relation give us all these different modal logics that we were worried about. Isn't that cool? Well, it was tremendously cool. It was crypty structure has been useful in computer science and all sorts of things. But for me, I still don't know what it is to be possible. <laughs> you know, that didn't help any, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Uh, is it possible for metal? to not, I mean, is it possible for gold not to be a metal? Is it possible for gold to be a vegetable? Well, people say no, but why not? Oh, well, because there's no possible world in which that happens. Well, shit, that doesn't help at all. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, and um, so I'm skeptical about this whole movement that you're talking about in terms of the way things are written. Um, on the other hand, you go to the other extreme and look at, uh, you know, Derrida and, well, Sartre's not so bad, but uh, Heidegger and Hegel. And uh, it's just, to me anyway, it, it's it's often you get an insight, but it, it, it it's not explained very clearly. And it, they kind of give a give up and then they kind of say, well, that's the problem isn't them. The problem is, uh, is the nature of thought or the nature of language. Well, I think analytic philosophy, as I was brought up in it, is a nice intermediate. Now, why do I think that? Well, pr probably because that's, that's the way I was brought up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when you do philosophy, you always have to have this double think, right? Uh, to do it, to write it, you got to think you're right, or at least your idea is a good idea. On the other hand, at the same time, if you're thinking about problems like free will and possibility and necessity and truth, uh, another part of your mind is saying, hey, come on, Perry. Aristotle thought about this. Plato thought about this. Hume thought about this. Kant thought about this. Wes Holiday thinks about it. He's a hell of a lot brighter than you are. Kaplan thought about it. Uh, probably still is thinking about it. David Lewis thought about it. What are the chances that you've got something right that those geniuses had wrong? Zero. <laughs> well, so when you sit down to write your essay, you have to take that part of your belief system and put it on the shelf because you, you kind of got to believe that you're onto something to write philosophy. So probably the reason I think I know what, I mean, so... My view of philosophy is my view of philosophy, but my meta view is who the fuck knows? I mean, Derrida, I met him once. He seemed like a pretty bright guy. Maybe he had a right. Maybe Heidegger had a right. Maybe Foucault, I met him too. He was a smart guy. Maybe he had a right. Um, Derrida, I gave it. So I had to give a talk about Derrida because the literature department's brought him over and everybody thought they had to have at least some one philosopher talk at the panel. So I read a bunch of Derrida and I, I gave a talk about what a great sense of humor Derrida had. And Derrida was there and after the, my talk, he said, you, you have me completely wrong. I didn't intend for any of that stuff to be funny. So mm. <laughs> that's a sidelight, but anyway. Mm. So anyway, yeah, so I'm not real happy with the, um, I, I mean, the biggest, I mean, when I was a graduate student, 19, 
64 to 68, about the time your grandparents were born, probably. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you were a serious graduate student, you had a topic, you know, like identity, or you could really read every article of, of a more or less analytical type that was written in that area in the major journals and even most of the minor journals. Um, you could do it. There, were, there weren't that many articles and very few books compared to now written. And like when I, uh, when I got uh, tenure at UCLA, I, I had just published two articles. Wow. <laughs> wow. And, um, and then I got an offer from Stanford and moved here, same two articles. Um, now, you know, with, with the birth of the computer, I guess that's, you know, it's just totally different, right? I mean, uh, what, what's your dissertation going to be about? No idea at this point. Okay. Well, whatever it's about, you'll just have so much to read. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if you don't read my structured procrastination book, you'll never be able to. Manage it. Uh, I'll move that to the top of the list. <laughs> yeah, put that at the top of the list. Well, if you put it at the top of the list, you won't read it for a long time. So. <laughs> It'll be a paradox, all right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so it it's all changed. And uh, when I when I became chairman at Stanford in about nineteen seventy four, I guess you know computers were already not personal computers, but uh, you know, deck 20s. And so people are using to use computers and it was all changing. And in the humanities at Stanford, they expected you to write a book to get tenure. And I really had to put my foot down to say, well, that's not the way it is in philosophy. We don't expect people to write books. <laughs> Maybe never at all, but certainly not in the first 10 years or so of their, you know, uh, trying to, you know, that's just silly. And, you know, so I put my foot down and we got some people tenure, but, but now it's really just all changed. Mm -hmm. You'll write your dissertation. You'll have to read an enormous amount to write your dissertation. Uh, just because so many articles are being written about any, everything. And then they'll expect you to turn it into a book. If you're, you know, at Stanford now, you, you know, you're supposed to have a book and a number of articles. Mm -hmm. uh, so, no, I like it the way it used to be. Hmm. Well, speaking of books, books uh, yeah. I'd like, I'd like to turn to identity, personal identity, and the self. Mm -hmm. And in a hundred or so conversations on the podcast, this is actually, I think, the first time that personal identity has come up. So maybe we should start with just what exactly the philosophical problem is that needs to be addressed here. Is it, um, is it something like the nexus of questions? Am I my body? Am I a mind that can be transported into other bodies? Uh, just what happens to me when I die? Or are these questions something that come after the, the general problem of, of personal identity? Well, um, how do you think of the, the problem in general, I guess? Well, first, there's the general problem of identity. And uh, people have been screwing around with that since Heraclitus, at least. Heraclitus says you can't step in the same river, river twice because new waters are ever rushing in. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, you got to, so, so identity itself is already puzzling because you, 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 you got, you got some, well, first terminologically in English, you got to be careful because when I use the term identity, I mean, identity is just one thing. I don't mean similarity. So maybe, maybe your friends will look at your apartment and say, wow, I, I, I want to get the same apartment. I want one identical to this. 
Well, that's English, but that's in philosophy. Well, I'll just use the word identity for just one thing because we've got the word similarity for other things. So, uh, so, so then the principle said, well, if A is identical with B, they have the same properties. Well, that's, that seems pretty likely. But then if the river has the property, if the river I stepped in yesterday has the property of, uh, having, you know, some dirty water in it. And by today, that water is passed on and the river I step in is full of clean water. Um, I guess it can't be the same river because uh, to the river I step in today has a property the river I step in yesterday didn't have. Well, that's bullshit. That's just because you're playing around with tents. Uh, if the river I stepped in yesterday had water in it yesterday and it's identical with the river i stepped in today then the river i stepped in today had water in it yesterday had dirty water in it yesterday you just want to pay attention to the tents there's not a problem mm -hmm. uh moral comparing this was what i said about frega time has been a problem for philosophers since heraclitus <laughs> through to the present and um uh, you know, Heraclitus was already letting logic lead his metaphysics. Um, and logic plus a reluctance to think about time, a continuing theme in philosophy. So what was my point? So you get, suppose, suppose you got a good theory of identity. Then the next thing you worry about is, well, look, I mean, the number seven is identical with the number Two plus five, right? Uh, the um, the highway you get on if you come off the Golden Gate Bridge and bear right, Pacific Coast Highway One, is the same highway that you can get on by um, going out. I don't know. <laughs> highway, what's the highway that goes there from here? Highway 580 or something like that. So, so you, you know, and it's the same highway that goes through uh, Santa Cruz and so forth and so on. So you got, you got high, but, you know, the highway you veer right on when you get off 101 and when you get off the Golden Gate Bridge being the same highway you go through Santa Cruz on, what does that have to do with you being the same guy that emailed me a week or two ago? Mm -hmm. I mean, so you have people say, well, there's not just one kind of identity. There's all kinds of identity. That's called the theory of relative identity. But I don't think it's right. I think there's just one kind of identity. And what there are is uh, things are made up of all different parts, temporal parts, spatial parts. And identity is usually a relation. I mean, the the characteristic relation for the identity of a kind of thing will be a relation between parts. So 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 you got to be fairly clear about identity, or you're just going to get totally screwed. With yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so so now so what? So okay, in the case of personal identity, so first, what are the relevant parts? And we'll put parts in quotation marks. Well, I mean. Uh, seems like a good place to start is 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 our experiences right what is the relation between experiences the experiences of the same person but of course you've got other things you've got actions what's the relation between actions that are actions of the same person uh that's kind of what you got to know if you're on a jury right you, you don't want to convict this guy for the crime that this guy did, unless this guy is identical with that guy. Uh, so I, personal identity is, so to speak, it's it's wired into a lot of human institutions, borrowing money, buying a house, having a title, getting your taxes right. It all kind of depends on the same person earning the income that pays the taxes and so forth and so on. But... On the other hand, uh, 
but we all have a kind of a sense of our own identity that doesn't necessarily depend on all those institutional features. I mean, uh, Bernard Williams said, uh, it, it, it's just, I, it, it's inconceivable that I shouldn't know who I am or something like that. Then in terms of the history of philosophy, particularly Western philosophy, the additional problem is that the notion of personal identity is built into Christianity. Oh, really? Well, yeah. I mean, Where heaven, does that happen? <laughs> heaven and hell, right? It's, uh, it's, you know, if, if God wants to punish you for all of these uh, podcasts that you've made that <laughs> he doesn't approve of. Yeah. <laughs> there he's are probably got, many of them. He's got a problem because on, on, on the Christian view, you will arrive in he- you will arrive at the pearly gates without a body. Right. I see. And okay, that's the, really interesting. All the criteria we use on earth to, for personal identity are, are bodily. Yeah. So what's oh. he going to what's he going to do? Um I mean, this problem goes, well, I'm not an expert, but it goes back probably before Aquinas, or St. Augustine, really. Um, uh, Because, I mean, what what makes an individual in heaven a given individual on earth? It can't be any set of physical characteristics, because a guy in heaven doesn't have any physical characteristics. You know, there, there's something interesting I think I should interject in with here is there was all there was a similar problem with regard to the resurrection of cannibals, because mm. if a cannibal ate part of somebody else's body and mm-hmm. they were both resurrected because the second person's body was incorporated into the first person's body they would be resurrected with two bodies, uh, with bodies that would share a part, and that was problematic. Right. Yes, problematic. For pers- reasons of personal identity, as you yeah, brought up. Yeah, exactly. So just going to just going to a, kind of a physical concept of a person doesn't exactly solve the problem, right? And then that leads to modern problems of split brains, like your, let's see, do you know um, McGuthrie, the graduate uh, student? Um, Mike McGuthrie, he's working on that for his dissertation. No, I don't know that name, but I do know about the split brains. Yeah. So, so personal identity has a history that has connected with religion and, you know, other religions have the same, not the same problem, but different problems. I mean, a lot of Eastern religions don't really believe in a retention of personal identity uh, in an afterlife, you become part of the one or something like that. So so if you're going to write about personal identity, uh, you kind of got to say, well, am I trying to justify something that will work for Christianity? And, you know, my answer was no. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to understand a little bit what would lead to the things they said about persons, but... Uh, so there's there's just a bunch of problems about personal identity, but um, in, intuitively they kind of come down to. I mean, the, the problem of personal identity is not the mind body problem, but they're certainly closely connected, right? So Descartes, um, you know, does his does his thing, and he says, "Well, uh, all I'm really certain of is my ideas." And uh, and my body is just part of the external world, which is not even really certain it's there. Uh, on the other hand, he does he's not skeptical about personal identity. At least as I remember that. It, he doesn't say, well, you know, how do I even know that I'm the same person writing Meditation 5 that was writing Meditation 1? Other philosophers have pointed out that he could have worried about it, but that he didn't worry about it. Um, so, so in the history of personality, in my humble opinion, uh, the big event was John Locke. Right, right. 
because he's got a great chapter on personal identity. He's probably the best philosopher there ever was. You know, maybe Hume. Um, Interesting. That's a, I've never heard that take before. Oh, really? Well, uh, you know, I, I admire a lot of philosophers, but the one who just strikes me as the brightest is Hume. And the one who strikes me as got the overall soundest approach to things is Locke. I mean, you know, for his time, but because mm-hmm. uh, uh, I mean, so so Locke, Locke on oh, the mind body problem. Locke says, well, you know, we got a distinction in mind and the body, and so forth and so on. He says, although on the other hand, I'm not at all convinced on philosophical grounds that the brain doesn't do the thinking, uh, which was you know, qu- quite an extreme view for him to entertain. He doesn't advocate it, but he says, look, just as a philosopher, I can't I can't see that. I mean, I got to accept it because I'm a Christian and all that shit, but then he goes on. But, so his idea of personal identity is you should mainly think of personal identity as a relation between experiences, uh, and, and the key is memory. Right. Actually, I, have, I, I, I found the quote, and I think it's in your book, and what he said, his actual words are, as far as this consciousness can be extended backwards to any past action or thought reaches the identity of that person. Yeah, good, good memory. That's exactly right. Now, the important thing is this consciousness. And he doesn't use the word memory too much. So what is this consciousness? Well, people use the term memory because he's talking about past actions and thoughts. But you got to distinguish between at least three kinds of memory. There's memory that... I remember that Columbus discovered America, but that doesn't mean I like discovered Like propositional. America. Yeah. And, or factual, yeah, or something. And then there's kind of event memory. Uh, um, I remember, oh Christ, who was it? Uh, who's the guy that shot Oswald? Harvey Oswald. You're, you're huh? not going to get any help from me. Right. But we can get help from Google if you want. Uh, I'll pick a more important event. <laughs> I remember Dwight Clark catching Joe Montana's past pass <laughs> uh, in in the first uh, NFL title game that San Francisco ever won from Dallas. Everybody, you remember that? <laughs> no. Surely your parents replayed it over and over, right? <laughs> they didn't. I don't remember this. Where, where are you from originally? Uh, Chicago. Oh, yeah. Nice place. Anyway, so so that's event memory. Remember perceiving an event, but that doesn't mean the action you perceived was yours. So if we, what he's talking about is what we call first person memory. And the interesting thing about it is, is we seem to leave out part of it. So I don't say. I remember that I had breakfast. I don't say I remember that John Perry ate breakfast or I remember John Perry eating breakfast. I could say those are both true. But what I say is I remember eating breakfast. Right. There's a seems to be a pronoun missing, Mm -hmm. but that's just the way we do it, (coughs) which is very interesting. So, so, so Locke has the memory view. And um, if, if you're, a naturalist and you think, well, hum- you know, persons are human beings, at least the ones we know about. Human beings are animals. The animals are part of the natural world. No particular reason to believe that there's anything very non-physical about them. At most, there's these uh, non-physical properties of the brain, if, if you want to believe in those qualia. But, you know, basically... Uh, we got all kinds of animals. Humans are, are a species of animals, and we use pretty much the same criteria that's test for identity for all of them, you know, the same same body and so forth and so on. Uh, so if you're a naturalist, you don't want to get too far away from that. But on the other hand, uh, it doesn't, doesn't seem like, it seems like you can accept Locke and you can accept that, yes, and this this kind of memory is is the product of evolution. Uh, it, it's you know it's something that humans and probably other higher level mammals have. Um, 
uh, and you know, some behavioral criteria for it because, you know, uh, uh, so forth and so on. So it's 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 not necessarily a non-naturalistic approach to personal identity. And people say, well, look, if you've got an animal and you've got the same animal, you must have the same person. Well, that's not quite right. Let's go back to roads and highways, right? <clears throat> when you when you when you come down um, Highway One from Eureka, and you come down Highway One Hundred One from Sacramento or wherever the hell it is, they meet at the Golden Gate Bridge, and you go across the Golden Gate Bridge, and then they have they part again. So you got you got clearly two different highways. You got Highway One and you got Highway One Hundred One. Um, the taxes from the state go for Highway One. The taxes from the federal government go for Highway One Hundred One because uh, one's a federal highway, one's a state highway. Uh, on the other hand. Uh, they seem to share this part. <laughs> uh, so is is the part that goes over the Golden Gate Bridge, is that two highways occupying the same space? Or is it something else? <laughs> so the point is that even you say highways are physical, roads are physical, state highways are physical, uh, national highways are physical, so that ought to solve all the problems, but it doesn't. Right. There's there's other things that are um, built in and so forth and so I'm just I just gambling on it. anyway. So so Locke's theory and some contemporary philosophers who've added to that Sidney Shoemaker and and Grice. I know that you you mentioned Grice. I said Grice. Yeah, Grice came up. <laughs> so Grice was. Uh, a student, I guess at Oxford, yeah, and um, he published one article pretty early in life. So I was on personal identity, and then he got um, he, he he got drafted into World War II. Oh, along I thought you were going to say he got drafted into the philosophy of language. <laughs> well, kind of that. After he got back from World War II, he kind of got drafted into philosophy of language. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, don't know. So it's pretty much the same with Austin uh, and Ermson. Ermson was in a in a prisoner's camp for most of World War II. He was one of the ones at Dunkirk that didn't make it to the ships in time. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, he's an old friend of mine. Oh, he's a dead friend of mine, actually. <laughs> uh, so what was my point? Yeah, <laughs> so, you kind yeah, of got a gallows I, sense of humor sometimes. Uh -huh. You kind of have a gallows sense of humor. Yeah, I suppose. So, so, so Grice, um, uh, Grice had this uh, incredibly important um, paper, a series of papers, uh, you know, about um, the philosophy of language and uh, pragmatics. But it's the first paper he published that most people didn't know about it until I included it in that anthology was this paper on personal identity that tries to take Locke's theory and sort of logically reconstruct it in terms of uh, concepts from logic like equivalence relation and so forth. I don't quite remember what Locke said and what I interpreted him as saying, but anyway, it was, it was a very nice uh, thing. And I got the idea that... Uh, <coughs> uh, to get Locke right, you had to, you know, to make Locke plausible, you had to put some conditions on this relation between uh, extending of consciousness, as he puts it, or first person memory. It it should be, it it should be, uh, it probably shouldn't be transitive, right? Uh, somebody showed that I don't know Butler or one of those guys. So uh, suppose we'll just take you, you're in Chicago, you go for a vacation to Minnesota, you and your brother go out and steal some raspberries, you get <laughs> caught, <laughs> right? Very traumatic event in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, 15 years later, you, you're in some war or other, uh, 
hate to think, but <laughs> you didn't serve in Afghanistan, did you? No. God, I did not. God. So let's suppose, though, you're in Afghanistan, you do something heroic. Uh, and as, as you're doing that heroic thing, you think, God, I've turned into a pretty good guy. I'm a hero. I'm saving all these people. I do remember stealing raspberries, which was a sin, but so, so the hero and the raspberry stealer, same person. Mm-hmm. Good first person memory. Uh, then, you know, 50 years later, or 60 years later, or 40 years later, you're a general getting senile. And you're sitting in your rocking chair, remembering your heroic deed. But by then, you can't remember stealing the raspberries. Hmm. Yeah. So, so this relation isn't transitive. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean personal identity isn't transitive. A is the same person as B. If there is an event such that A did it and B remembers it, or if there is a sequence of events such that each member of the sequence each yeah remembers the previous one, but you don't require that the first one require it. No. Right, but they're both part of the sequence. Yeah. But then, you know, you can think of examples. Well, that's not going to quite work because, you know, you, you have to... Uh, allow that it's the same as if A has a first person memory of this earlier person stage's actions and uh, C who's beyond A also has a memory of this earlier person's actions but A doesn't <laughs> You have to change the direction. <laughs> yeah, this is where a chalkboard would be helpful. Yeah, but Grice kind of figures that all out. That's a very big contribution. Um, so it's an interesting subject. Uh, and uh, I wrote a anthology that still brings in a couple hundred bucks a year. So <laughs> Right. Well, I've still got um, more questions about it. Good. And so one alternative to the memory theory is the body identity theory. And I think you you also mentioned Bernard Williams, who wrote about this and got engaged in the, the body identity memory theory debate. Yeah. And it's funny, I just as I hadn't known that Grice was involved in personal identi- identity, I've heard Bernard Williams uh, invoked, his name invoked many, many times. And I know that he's worked in a lot of areas. I was mainly familiar with him from a value theory yeah. but i didn't know that he had his hand in in this as well so first what is i guess the we might call it the the steel man version of body identity theory because when we were talking about resurrection heaven and hell it mm-hmm. already seemed kind of uh, unlikely but evidently some very prominent contemporary philosophers have argued for it Well, yeah, because, of course, you know, naturalism is becoming, which is roughly physicalism, roughly, you know, you know, whatever you need metaphysically to talk about rocks and boulders and ants and frogs and that'll do for persons, (laughs) including their minds and their bodies and everything. And don't bug me about what the Pope says, because what does he know? Uh, (laughs) Uh, and so, uh, have you read stuff by this guy Olson? He's a he's a big name in personal identity now, and I haven't actually read his book. On the other hand, I have bought it. So, uh, that's a start. But is it he, at the top of your list or the bottom of your list? <laughs> I guess reading it must be really important because uh, I've had the book for five years and haven't gotten around to it. Mm. <laughs> um, I did that's read a high, high praise for him. Yeah, I read a little bit about where he criticizes me, and you know he's obviously a very bright guy. But um, uh, he, but the problem is bodily identity is not 
Well, so so I think it's a mistake to say, well, humans are animals, and animals are physical beings, and so they just have bodily identity as a. But like the case of highways, all kind of, human beings have rich set of concepts that they you know stuff happens. We have concepts. We use it to describe the stuff that happens. It's not a simple relationship, right? Um, now, if you think if if you think that persons are, you know, what God invented and decided exactly what the rules should be, that's one thing. But if you think that stuff happens and that persons are an important concept that over the millions of years that humans have been evolving, we've developed to deal with this part of the phenomena, this part of the stuff that happens, then maybe your expectations aren't quite as high. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think, yeah, it's, in some sense I want to say, yeah, humans are animal, you know, what, what, what is, what is the name of it? You could, uh, are just things or just bodies or just live bodies or I don't know. Body identity theory. Yeah. Body identity theory. But it, you know, it just doesn't seem to answer all the questions we have. As, uh, you know, if uh, if Elon Musk and some of his friends, <laughs> as I like to think of it, you know, 50 years from now, we've got some steel sheds across the bay full of computers uh, that have been programmed to extend the identity of Elon Musk and some others. And it turns out nobody's interested in them, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> some people somebody goes over there once a week and makes sure they're okay. Uh, anyway, I'm getting all lost in one of my unwritten novels. But anyway, <laughs> uh, does it not make sense for Elon Musk to think that he could live on as a as a piece of AI? Maybe I have a much much more advanced sort than we have now. Is that crazy? No, well, it may be, but can you just dismiss it out of hand by saying, you know, personal identity is whatever you said it was. I, I, so I don't know. Then also, uh, there's Wittgenstein. Uh, and I have in mind by Wittgenstein, by the way, Wittgenstein had two phases. You know, he wrote the Tractatus. Uh, after he was in, totally taken with Frege and Russell. So that was, you know, logic dictating metaphysics, if there ever was, right? And then later on, it's the other way around. He says, oh, you know, just look at the way we talk, the distinctions we make, the language games we play, try to figure out what's going on. That's what philosophy is all about. Um and that's more, he wouldn't say metaphysics first, because I don't think he liked the word metaphysics, but that that's that's kind of, so I'm, I'm more a Wittgensteinian, and as, as that kind of Wittgensteinian, I don't, I don't expect to have knock down proofs with little squares and diamonds and existential quantifiers to disprove people like Olson. I say, well, we're we're working on understanding how the concepts we have deal with this shit that happens, and uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I just uh, am not confident enough. But I'll be happy if I can. To me, the lock theory, the shoemaker theory, part of what William says, uh, part of what Parfit says. And a lot of what I say all seems very plausible and it must be at least part of the truth. Two figures that we haven't talked about that I know you've referenced and thought a lot about on personal identity are Derek Parfit and David Lewis. Mm -hmm. And I actually just did an episode with Graham Priest and Frank Jackson all about the philosophy of David Lewis, but we didn't get to personal identity at all. Mm -hmm. So I was curious if we could just touch a bit on their contributions to personal identity and how you see them fitting in to this memory and the memory and the body theories that we mm -hmm. touched on. Okay. 
<laughs> you want me to start talking? Yeah, yeah, start talking. Okay, well, uh, Dave, Dave and I are, uh, well, he's dead, but <laughs> we we were friends for a long time. We were assistant professors together at UCLA, and you know, I guess associate professors too. David had a <laughs> kind of odd, he, he had a very rich ontology uh in terms of possible worlds, he believed in an infinity of possible worlds, and he thought each of them was as real and actual as our own. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember the first time he told me that that's the way he was get, was thinking of things. I told him, David, that's crazy. You know, nobody nobody will believe that. You should you could forget that idea. Uh, so much for my prognostication skills. Mm-hmm. But when it came to each world, um, his ontology was uh, uh, pretty sparse. I mean, in the sense that he believed in, uh, I don't know exactly how to put it, but little tiny things <laughs> uh, and sets. And uh, between little tiny things and sets and resemblances and possible worlds, you know, he could get by pretty well. But uh, so he did not really. So 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 I, I think he, his personal identity view, you, you first should look at it as a kind of a Lockean view. He's really thought that the psychological connections between uh, person episodes was the key. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then he, he didn't really want uh persons in his ontology he only wanted the episodes so kind of he thought of each episode as a a person uh and then with the way we talked was we just kind of treated them as if they were the same if they had this psychological relation now i may not have that quite right it's a long time ago uh <laughs> i wrote a paper on it a year or two ago uh so I don't think that's too far off. But an episode is just a, an instance or or a segment of psychological connectedness. Well, it's what I, what I would call a person stage. It's um, you know, you just I think of person stages as perfectly okay entities, but I think. Uh, a person is made up of person stages. Um, that doesn't mean a person is a set of person stages any more than a highway is a set of mile long stretches. It just, I mean, that's, that's my view. Now, Parfit, um, Parfit came up with what he thought was a good counter example to the Locke shoemaker psychological view, a case of splitting persons. You know, you have a some kind of brain operation where you, I, I don't remember his exact example, but you separate the two halves of the brain and transplant them in different bodies that are short of a brain, and then you get two people that have an equal claim on being the original person with the bla- brain, and, and he thought, well, that you know, you, you, whatever answer you get, you get a paradox. But there's still nothing terribly mysterious going on as long as you realize that it's it's not persons and identity that are important, but person stages and the psychological relation. Mm-hmm. So it's rather similar to Lewis's in that way. Um, and uh, uh, then, he, you know, he had a lot of good ideas in his person in his book uh, reasons and persons is very very perceptive fellow um, but I, I think that first step is wrong I don't think it follows from the f- fact that we have this uh, problem uh, with the possibility of uh, splitting that uh, you need to abandon the notion of personal identity uh, or or think that it's not important. Um, I wrote a paper about the same time as Parfit's paper 
um, called Can the Self Divide? As far as I can reconstruct, we sent our papers to the field review at the same time and without any knowledge of one another at that point. And his got accepted, mine got rejected. (laughs) So I sent mine somewhere else, maybe Noose. And uh, so I was on the stage about a year after him because it takes a long time. But my view was a a little bit different. I I don't... uh, I, I think there's uh, a solution, in fact, more than one compatible solution uh, for talking about the um, splitting brains case where you don't have to give up personal identity. Uh, at the time, I thought you should say that there were three people, um, one a Y-shaped person, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, then each branch of the Y. And they each they each um, they each satisfied my analysis of being a person. And uh, then what was unusual was that they overlapped. Right. And uh, I don't now now know that that's the best way to look at it. Uh, that was a long time ago. Say I don't know, seventies or something. Paper I wrote a couple of years ago takes a little bit more flexible view. But I, I, I do think to give up the notion of personal identity because of this problem is to uh, miss, miss the important point that we do in our human ontology that we use, recognize these entities that have spatial parts and temporal parts. And... Um, uh, virtually any kind of object you can you can uh, create these problems for, you know, splitting and so forth, and you may not know exactly what to say, but that doesn't show that the whole concept of identity and of objects extended in space and time should be thrown out. It's it's uh, it's very <laughs> useful and really embedded in um, human institutions, and also. Uh, does a pretty good job of getting at what it's like to be a person. So, so I thought Parfit and Lewis were both brilliant. I thought uh, Lewis was brilliant, but but had a lot of bad, overarching metaphysical views. Um, and I thought Parfit just, you know, had a lot of insights, but but kind of went too far on on the. Uh, on the issue of uh, 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 drew, drew drew unwarranted conclusions from the possibility of puzzle cases, mm. um, and uh, now they're both dead and I'm alive. So maybe now they're in a position where they know a lot more about it. You know, <laughs> talk to Saint Peter and all the other. But um, I digress. <laughs> At the end of all of this, you still find yourself a memory theorist, right? You're still broadly Lockean in your conception of personal identity. Yeah, I, w- I would, I would, I would, I would, I now describe it as Lockean Bratman, Lock Bratman, because Lock gives you the picture of your connection with past person stages, your <laughs> that makes your present person stage a stage of the same person as them. And uh, uh, Bratman, with his concept of intention, really shows how you need something similar going into the future and uh, how crucial that is to our concept of a person. That is, uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot of of animals that have desires and beliefs of of some, uh, you know, and, and then that you could kind of say, well, yeah, they primitive animals have needs and perceptions and then it, then more complicated animals we could say oh, well they have something like beliefs and perceptions and they can have different beliefs about their surroundings depending on their perceptions and that will lead them to do different things so there's kind of something like the human will where uh, something like beliefs and something like desires get combined and determine action 
uh, but what you don't see, um, uh, I wouldn't say you don't see it in any non-human animals, but uh, it's not very obvious that it, it's the case in non-human animals, is this ability to um, uh, not, not to, to what we call it, uh, introspection and interoception. That is, uh, you not only are aware of, you know, presumably it's something like, it's like something to be a bat or a dog or a cat. Uh, but uh, humans not only are aware of what's going on in their mind, they can stop and think about it. They can give names to various things going on in their mind or titles. Then they can think about where they came from. Uh, and I think I saw connected with the difference between just being free and having free will. Uh, but um, uh, this this gives them the ability to um, plan. Um, this is something I'm thinking about these days, so I won't give you the full finished theory because I don't have it yet. But Bratman says a lot of plausible things about it. So, so the idea is that we really have your your present person stage uh, is connected to past person stages by a Lockean Shoemakerian memory based relation, uh, and and your your it's it's connected to future person stages, which is a bit misleading because they don't exist yet. <laughs> But uh, they will, you know, and they will be formed as a result of uh, your present intentions and plans. And, you know, so, so forming an intention and planning is really a way of influencing what you're going to do in the future. But, but what comes with it is, is kind of a, 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 a commitment to certain values and things that's the way i'm looking at it but i haven't quite figured out but so i i think of it as the lock bratman view of persons yeah. <laughs> um and I, I think that pleases bratman so and is it the lock bratman view of personal identity or of person so i, I like i i think you answered a lot of this question that uh, i already had but maybe we can make it more explicit but I, I guess I, I think of my cat here in my lap mm -hmm. and I want to say that she probably has some self, some sense of self, yeah. but at the same time, despite my love for this cat, I also don't want to say that she's a person right. yet. I wonder to what extent, I mean, is this just out of linguistic habit? Uh, because I also think of person as like a cognate of people. Or, mm -hmm. or synonymous yeah. with human, but how does this idea of personal identity uh, fit in with personhood so as to exclude uh, my cat from being a person? <laughs> well, okay, let's think about it. So, so first, we want to make sure we are distinguished between uh, unity relations and identity. Okay. Uh, grab your cat's tail. If I can uh, find it. I found it. Now, now grab her head. <laughs> no, with a different hand. Well, different yeah, hand. Yeah, well, you can imagine doing it anyway. So, so, so now you've got you've got a cat with this head and a cat with this tail. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not it. What's the relation between the tail and the head? Well, they're not identical. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, in a philosophical seminar, we might bring a box and a couple of cats to make the point that you know you can have a Frega problem, right? You can. Uh, you can be thinking about this cat, the one you're holding the head of, and this cat, the one you're holding the tail of, but not realize that <coughs> it's the same cat. Mm. But your cat's tail and your cat's head have, have a relation. They're connected by cat stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, a lot of it. And that means that the cat you refer to with the cat with his head and the cat you refer to with the cat with his tail are identical. Okay, and so the difference between different kinds of things 
uh, that have very different standards or criteria of identity. It's not different identity relations, according to me at least, but different unity relations. And what's what personal identity theorists are disagreeing about uh, is the unity relation. Uh, and um, and the unity relations, you know, there's a temporal unity relation and a physical, spatial, physical, right? Physical. Now, do we need to bring in? Do we need to bring in memory or anything like that to get it the the cat unity relation through time, or is it just? enough that their phases if we if we have a fairly rich concept of animal bodies through time mm -hmm. and if we've got the same cat body don't we have the same cat do we really need to worry about you know memory and intention well i don't know i suspect we don't need to but it might be useful for certain kinds of cases that philosophers can probably dream up involving, you know, cat brain transplants and maybe, you know, first first you create a super cat that has a lot more brain than the average cat. And I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but but being a person uh, involves well seems to involve being a human being. Well, what do we say about human beings that really don't have the brain power to do the ordinary things? Well, uh, most of the ones that have working brains at all uh, have memory and a certain amount of anticipation. I mean, autism, things like that. They don't, they don't lead to anything that would destroy <laughs> application of the unity relation for personal identity through time. But uh, um, we can imagine, and or or now take children. Children um, remember things. I think from day one, in some extended sense of re remember, right? I mean, uh, a newborn will treat very quickly treat its mother different than other things. Um, but do they have a rich enough memory to really plug in this whole Locke Shoemaker idea? I don't know. But uh, so I, it may be that children aren't really persons yet. Uh, you know Michael Tooley? I don't. Okay, well, <laughs> he's a great philosopher. Uh, so there's a Nobel Prize in philosophy, he should get it. Him or Dan Dennett. But. Uh, uh, where is he? Uh, Tooley's in Colorado now. He was at Stanford when I got here. Matter of fact, I think uh, uh, they were able to hire me because they decided to fire him, mm. which seemed to me at the time a terrible mistake. To yeah, fire what do you him. have to do to get fired from a philosophy department in the <laughs> in in that time? Well, uh, at that time, the department didn't give tenure very often. I see. Uh, when I got here in 19, whatever it was, 73, I think the last person who'd been promoted from the ranks to get tenure was David Nibison. And that had been, I don't know, 15, 20 years before. In the meantime, they had uh, really not given tenure to some superb philosophers, including Michael Tooley, uh, but also <laughs> uh logician specializing in probability whose name I can't quite remember, but he went on to Princeton and was very famous. Um, and it was reason, the reason was because you had this, this colossal figure, Pat Soupies, you know, Pat Soupies. So Pat Soupies was, had come to the department and a tremendously brilliant person with a very powerful personality. And, um, uh, so he just, you know, he didn't get enthused about people very easily. Mm. Uh, and then you had Julius Moravchik, who was much uh, more um, like a normal philosopher, but uh, didn't have as much influence as Pat. And then you had Stanford, which, like a lot of uh, universities, um, 
in my humble opinion, exploits the tenure system for a purpose that it wasn't created for. Uh, namely, a tenure system is supposed to give job security to people do a good job. You know, you come get some research done, you're a good teacher, you should get tenure. But Stanford, Harvard, a lot of those places, Yale, basically use it as an excuse to fire people who have done a good job, uh, uh, but somehow don't measure up or they think they can find somebody better. But I'm digressing. Anyway, mm. but Tully then went to Australia and then um, ended up in Colorado. So uh, <laughs> the point was that Tully, this was way back or not too long after Roe versus Wade. So uh, abortion was uh, a topic then as it is now. And Tooley wrote a good article and then a good book on abortion, I thought. And his main point was that um, uh, if, if we think, if, we, if we're bothered by abortion, we think we should, well, in other words, <laughs> how do I put this? Most people want to draw the line somewhere, as was done in Roe versus Wade, between having an abortion, the point at which having an abortion is a relatively trivial matter, does not involve anything approaching murder. You know, it's more like, uh, and then by the ninth, well, let's say by the time the kid is two years old, it's murder. Right. Now, somewhere in there, you have to draw a line and say, well, it doesn't have to be a very sharp line, but you have to explain, you know, it's like the bald paradox, right? So where, when does it become wrong? And when does it become so wrong that it's murder? Mm -hmm. uh, and Julie argued that if you really have a, a good definition of a, if you think it's not wrong until you have a person, uh, that it, it's perfectly reasonable to say, well, you really don't have a person until they're one or two years old. Can pass the mirror test. You know what the mirror test is? Yeah. Um, Recognizing themselves? Yeah. <laughs> now, I think Thule had a very good point. I didn't agree with him that we should wait <laughs> until the kid is two years old before being upset by killing the kid. I actually thought Roe versus Wade, whatever its virtues as a piece of constitutional interpretation was a very reasonable approach to abortion. Uh, so what was my point? I forget what my point was. Anyway, so being a person isn't, if you have this view uh, about personal identity and so forth, it looks like certain kinds of brain accomplishments, mind accomplishments, intellectual abilities, uh, are connected with being the sort of thing that can stand with being the sort of episode that can stand in the unity relation to past and future episodes of personhood in the way that you should if you've got a single person. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's, um, it's kind of complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, I could go on and on about abortion, but for example, here's what you could do with season seven. Why is why 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 is abortion always been considered objectionable, at least by a lot of people, but not masturbation? I mean, sperm are alive; they're alive. They swim. They're definitely human. You know, why are they definitely human? I mean, uh, well, one significant difference is, I mean, the zygote can become a human, but the a sperm by itself can't. Yeah, but that's not the explanation because long before they realized that, they, I mean, I basically mean the Catholic Church, <laughs> uh, when they thought that kind of since the sperm came from the male, it must be where the soul is. They still didn't object to masturbation, even though there is a line in the Bible that says you shouldn't spill your seed on the ground. Hmm. 
So you can draw the line between a sperm and a zygote, but it's just, it's not, to me, not overwhelmingly right. obvious that that's where you should draw the right. line. Uh, and I thought Ro, Ro versus Wade did a pretty good job. But I think we're digressing from the main thing you wanted to explore and getting into things I have strong but not very scholarly opinions about. <laughs> you're you're welcome to explore those uh, opinions right. on the podcast yeah, anyway. as much as you like. And so I actually thought, I actually think uh, Tuli's uh, stuff on abortion uh, didn't help him in the in the ten year battle at Stanford. Mm. I, you know, it was over by the time I got here, so I can't really say. But sure, it's uh, <laughs> a, a kind of a, a defensive infanticide is not probably the best way. Yeah, to get tenure, <laughs> to get tenure at a university uh, uh, whose biggest building is a church. Yeah, you've got to wait until you have tenure for that. <laughs> yeah. Right. So anyway, so anyway, that's how I think of personal identity. I don't claim to have it all figured out, but uh, yeah, I have, I don't I can't think of a view that I think is more plausible than mine. Um, but mine is very complicated and maybe there should be a simpler theory of what a person is. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Are there, so I was going to ask about the relationship between personal identity and ethics. And then also these, this cluster of metaphysical questions and questions of vagueness that you got into with regard to uh, when persons come into existence. Mm -hmm. But there are there any substantively uh, different questions or ethical considerations that are related to when a person goes out of existence? So naturally, when they die. <laughs> when they die, right. Well, uh, of course, difference of opinion on that is one reason that personal identity became so important to philosophers or, or rather the the opinion which I don't share that uh, when we when our physical bodies die we continue existing as persons in heaven or hell uh, that you right medieval philosophers saw a lot of problems with and uh, argued a lot about it said some very intelligent things um, but uh, uh <laughs> but the ethics of it is, I mean, I don't know. Um, it, it's no matter how bad a person is, it doesn't. I mean, so, so Strawson, Peter Strawson, uh, had a lot of interesting things to say, but his son Galen Strawson uh, has, I think, <laughs> even more plausible things to say, including some pretty good criticisms of his father. But uh, the idea of heaven and hell that, you know, you've got people at the end of their um, uh, physical life either deserve to go to someplace wonderful or so someplace horrible uh, seems like a bad idea. Now, I'm not sure which real philosophers ever really held that. I mean, I don't know, Aquinas or those, who knows. But Dante surely did. And <laughs> um, then you say, oh, well, the Catholic Church has, a, has an intermediate stage. I forget what they call it. Do you remember? No. Oh, uh, Limbo? Limbo, yeah, Limbo. Yeah. So, I don't know, may maybe... Uh, it would have, I would have thought a better idea on God's part would have just have everybody come to the same place, but treat them different uh, in, a, in a way that's more measured and responsive to exactly how good or how bad they are. Uh, but in terms, if we forget all that, what, what, what does personal identity have to do with the ethics of death? I don't know. You got an idea? You got a question or a problem that occurs to you? No, it just occurred to me while reading. Uh, your book. I mean, I guess I what I had in mind were considerations that would take us somewhat far afield 
uh, from the line of discussion we've been following. And I was just thinking about why it is that yeah. something that is a person, why you don't want to kick a person, but you can kick a rock. Right. <laughs> and, and according to, to some of us, it's, it's okay to, to, to kill a one day old zygote, but, uh, no, I mean, one place it comes up is with Alzheimer's and things that even are more destructive of the brain. So often by the time a, a person dies physically or a human being dies physically, they've lost the mental capacities that are kind of definitive or at least paradigmatic of being a person. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and so is it is it immoral to. Well, start, start, is it immoral to help someone who is in that state or approaching that state to commit suicide? Uh, well, there's differences of opinion on that. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, it, is killing a person late in stages of Alzheimer's um, murder? Murder in an unqualified sense? Murder in some kind of footnoted sense where it's not so bad? Those are interesting issues, which I haven't thought that much about, mm -hmm. uh, but for which I think a, a good account of personality would would be would be helpful. Um, you ever you, know anybody with Alzheimer's? Not Alzheimer's. My grandmother had a pretty serious cognitive decline and dementia, yeah. but not Alzheimer's. Well, my father had Alzheimer's, and the, and the funny thing was that uh, well, there's there's three stages. There, when you're getting it, and everybody's noticing and kind of convincing you that it's happening, and that's pretty miserable. And then there's a stage when you're when you're into it, when you have it, uh, and then there's a stage at the end when you have a painful death. Now, the intermediate stage, as far as I can tell, is very bad. It's very hard on the the relatives of the and friends and loved ones of the person who has Alzheimer's. But for the person with Alzheimer's, it's not so bad. My father was, uh, we, we finally had to put him in a home and he enjoyed the home. I mean, he, he was a World War II veteran and uh, 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 came to think that the home was uh, a prison camp uh, run by some incredibly nice nurses. <laughs> okay. Uh, and he and, and some of his fellow vets used to sneak down to the fence that went around the place and put uh, put notes under the fence saying we're being held prisoner in an Italian prisoner of war camp. But, but on the whole, uh, you know, so the point is, um, I don't know what the point. I never really able to quite make sense of that. I have a feeling, even though I think when if I when I get Alzheimer's, I won't be so miserable. I would just as soon not get it, and might well commit suicide if I thought it was coming. Mm. Uh, but then I'd have to see what that would mean about insurance, and then, <laughs> then it just becomes a an act of drudgery, huh? Yeah, you might as well just hold on admit that you're going to be hard on everyone for a while and then die a painful death. Anyway, anyway. Uh, but I'm sure a really good, perfect concept of personal identity with all the intentions and memories thought out might, might be really helpful in considering that. Although I doubt very much if it would decide the issue, mm -hmm. but One philosophically what issues ever get decided. One other thing that came to mind uh, while you were talking is I'm watching this television show called the terror and oh. yeah it's covering this uh, a horror version of this arctic expedition in the mid 1800s <laughs> in which these ships were sort of locked in ice in mm. the arctic and then all of the men died but they it's a true story and they had to they left and tried to march back uh, south uh, into Canada, uh, but yeah. they they didn't make it. But anyway, they had to resort to cannibalism somewhere along the line, yeah. along the way, and that's an interesting problem in its own right. That's that's very much related to personal identity and and personhood. Yeah. Because when you die, presumably you're not a person anymore, uh, or at least the 
the philosopher might think that you're no longer a person, but we'd yeah, still be yeah. very resistant to treating the person as just uh, meat that we desperately need in yeah. this situation. Well, I, I, I once met a guy uh, who had eaten someone. <laughs> he in was a situation a, like this? Yeah, he was a pilot in a, it, it was in Canada, northern part of Canada. And he had uh, been a pilot, still was a pilot. So he picked up a uh, a mother and her ill daughter to fly them to a hospital, you know, in the more civilized part of Canada. Uh, and the plane crashed, and the mother died. And then there was quite a long period. They didn't have any other food. And uh, eventually he did eat some, you know, <clears throat> some some flesh of the mothers. And he tried to get the daughter to do so. I, I, I can't quite remember whether he forced her to, but anyway, I think eventually he made it with the daughter to the hospital, so forth and so on. And uh, nobody seemed to think very badly of him because of that. Now, maybe that's just, because in northern Canada, you just kind of walk around with that possibility in mind. But um, yeah, uh, that's the stuff of a horror novel, though, forcing yeah. somebody's daughter but, to eat their mother. Yes, it's kind of horrible to think about. And then there was, the, you know, the people that came across uh, to California. What were they called? Uh, the people that crossed the Bering Strait or no, no, people Lewis were... and Clark, the Dahmer Party. Don, what did the Dalmer party do? Yeah, they the end Donner up eating, party. Donner, yeah. There's yeah. still there's Donner Pass up. Yeah, so they ended up performing a little bit of cannibalism. Uh, that uh, I guess didn't go over too well when they finally I made. Mean, I haven't looked into it historically. No, that sounds either. like an interesting uh, and depressing uh, thing to watch on TV. Hmm. No, no, it's a it's a good show. I yes. watch it uh, in the morning when I'm walking the dog. Yeah, I wonder what Tucker Carlson would think of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you watch it when you're walking the dog. Do you watch it on your phone or what? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's what I do. Oh, your generation, I see. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the, the last thing that I wanted to touch on before we finished is, so we've talked about personal identity. We've talked about persons. And the last thing in in this holy trinity that comes to mind for me is the self. And what's the relationship between personal identity, personhood, and the self? Well, um, uh, so I'll just, I don't know exactly where to start, but uh, so, so all animals, matter of fact, any creature that is any cellular creature, on earth uh does what some of us call harnessing information which is a very simple idea uh start with a mouse trap an old-fashioned mouse trap uh so you know there's a little pedal you put cheese on it it goes down and the thing snaps and kills the mouse so so that's that's a very important kind of design so you have you have you have the the pedal going up and down carries the information that there's a mouse there. Mm -hmm. Of course, it only carries that information relative to a lot of assumptions, right? If you get an old-fashioned mousetrap, put cheese on it, put it in the middle of the living room floor, uh, that that won't carry the information that there's a mouse there, or at least it won't make it terribly probable. It's more likely to be my toe in the middle of the night. But if right. you're careful and you put the mouse trap between the refrigerator and the wall, then it's very probable that if it goes up and down, you know, far enough in that your cat can't get it, then if it goes up and down, very probable it carries the information as a mouse in front of it. Mm -hmm. And that changes things on the, what we might call the inside of the mouse trap, right? This goes down. This little lever is loose. It's what was holding the spring. So the spring goes whap. 
Right. right? <laughs> so what we have is we have uh, a mechanism that uh, has information about the world around it uh, due to being in various states that it goes into. And those states in turn cause it to do something uh, that benefits it. Except, of course, the, the mousetrap doesn't give a shit whether it kills a mouse or not. But the owner had a value that is enhanced by its working that way. Anyway, so uh, Fred Retzke's favorite example was the um, uh, what he called the magnetosome, which isn't quite the right title for it. But it's what he had in mind was um, a, a creature that lives in the ocean and particularly in the northern Atlantic. And it's just, it's got a built-in magnet. Uh, I know these creatures. You do? <laughs> yeah. How do you know them? I don't know where I read about them. I, yeah. It might have been in some, I was into evolutionary biology yeah. for a while. Okay. So yeah. it might just, they just have this fascinating adaptation. Yeah, yeah. So they are. So, so these creatures can't take much oxygen. So when the magnet inside them points at magnetic north and they're in the Atlantic, most of the Atlantic, most of the northern Atlantic, if they swim in that direction, they will go deeper into the ocean because of the curvature of the Earth. Mm. Uh, so by swimming in that direction, which they do automatically, uh, they do something that is a benefit to them, not really, but broadly speaking, right? It helps their survival because they go deeper in the ocean, less oxygen-rich waters, they survive. Now, of course, the magnesium, no evidence that they care about survival. So we kind of have to personify nature to find someone who cares whether magnesium survive or not. Mother Nature seems to want everything to survive long enough to spawn some more things. But the point is that that basic mechanism of having a state that contains information about the outside world and that causes a movement or a change that benefits the organism or somebody else involved like Mother Nature um, or the owner of the mousetrap, uh, uh, is a very powerful one. And, you know, we, we just see it all the way up, including human beings, of course. We've we've taken it to, uh, I mean, your cat works that way, right? She, <laughs> she sees them. Anyway, so harnessing information. Now, so our internal states are very important. Now, humans, and I assume mammals and uh, lots of animals, but probably not magnetosomes, maybe snails, pretty surely frogs, have something like consciousness. You know, some, it's like something to be a hungry frog, I assume. I'm sure it's like something to be a hungry cat. And, um, uh, now, uh, okay, <laughs> keep that in mind. Now I'm going to change. Uh, Ernst Mach was a famous physicist. Yeah, I was going to bring him up. Huh? I was going to bring him up. Okay, so he gets on the bus, mm -hmm. and he sees uh, a fellow in the mirror at the other end of the bus, uh, and he says, uh, what, a, what a shabby pedagogue that guy is. But it was his, but it was himself in the mirror. Okay, so so he had uh, uh, he had two conceptions, or we say so. So he he saw himself, perceived himself, uh, formed opinions about himself. That is about the person who he in fact was, but he didn't realize that, as we would say, that that was he himself. Right. Um, but now, now consider having a headache. Um, 
you don't make that kind of mistake with headaches. <laughs> I mean, if you have a headache, you know whose headache it is. It's yours. So do you have a little file in your mind for Robinson? And then when you have a headache, you realize that, that it's that person that has the headache? Well, in a way you do, but that's kind of beside the point because uh, that's a pretty late development. But, but you know, uh, uh, a kid just out of the womb feels hunger. It knows in some sense uh, who has to suck on the nipple to relieve that hunger. I mean, not in any conceptual sense, but um, right. that is self-knowledge, right? Um, so, so basic self-knowledge uh, is not knowledge that a certain person has a certain, you know, um, certain attribute. It's just awareness of an attribute in the way that one is only aware of one's own attributes. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, there's a lot of that going on before you really develop a concept. I mean, kids, uh, uh, humans can pass the mirror test at about two years of age. And, you know, once they, that'd be a good thing to write a dissertation about a mirror test, by the way. Uh, <laughs> once <laughs> Got a lot of experimental stuff, a lot of psychologists saying things, but philosophers could clean it up. So, um, uh, so, so, so once a kid passes the mirror test, and you know, they, they kind of realize that they are one of a group that have similar attributes, uh, but but they don't confuse the attributes that they know about, they know to be theirs automatically, like whether they need to pee or throw up or whether they're hungry or so forth, uh, with, with the ones that aren't like that, like whether tall, skinny, ugly, so forth and so on. So I think basic self-knowledge is just the knowledge that you have of your own inner states uh, and, you know, not, not just introspection, uh, which is <clears throat> kind of sophisticated, but interoception uh, uh, and what was what's another thing they call? Anyway. There's proprioception? Two, huh? Proprioception? Proprioception. Yeah, that's actually you no know, whether your legs are crossed. So that's kind of an interesting. Uh, so I think that's the basis of self-knowledge. So there's... <clears throat> <laughs> yourself, the person you are, is the person you know about in what I call self-informative ways. Automatically self-informative or intrinsically self-informative. And there are also self-affecting actions. So, for example, that's a way that we all would use to scratch our nose uh, and um, raise our hand. And if I if I raise someone's hand in the way I just raised my hand, it's my hand I've raised, mm -hmm. right? Presumably, raising the hand or scratching the nose for you, you do it in just the same way I do, but you can't scratch another person's nose that way, right? So I think our basic self-concept... Is 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 uh, so you go back to Descartes. Um, uh, Hume too, but I'll put Descartes before De Hume. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> yeah, major philosophy joke. <laughs> yes. Well, anyway, so, um, so Descartes said, "I think, therefore I am," and you know, uh, not everybody was convinced. They say. Uh, who wasn't convinced? Well, oh, shit. Some important people whose names will come to me. But um, they say, well, no. I mean, you have experiences. You have ideas. So you know those experiences and ideas exist. But you don't have any experience of something further, the I, the self, that has those ideas and experiences. 
So you really, you, you really weren't in a position to say, I think, therefore, I exist. You were just in a position to say, thinking goes on. Mm-hmm. And nothing follows that follows from that about you. It just follows that there are some ideas. And Hume kind of had this, got in, into the same thing. He says, you know, but for, forget about Hume. So, so I think those critics were right. Um, who the hell am I thinking of? I don't know. Foucault, maybe. <laughs> but I doubt it. Um, uh, so that the primitive self-knowledge is not, so to speak, knowledge about a person, although it is knowledge about a person. So, but did you tell me you raised chickens? No, that was somebody else. <laughs> no, that was not me. <laughs> okay. So, so take a chicken. Chicken is out in the field. Maybe you've read all my stuff about chickens. I don't know. So, so a chicken's in the bar yard and sees a kernel of corn in front of it. Mm-hmm. Um, the chicken walks forward, pecks, as a result of pecking, it gets nutrition. So that's harnessing information. Um, did the chicken realize that the kernel was in front of it? Well, no, I would say. It just saw a kernel and... It didn't need to know. Chickens don't pass the mirror test. It didn't need to realize. <clears throat> but we as theorists, when we look at the chicken, we, we need to say, no, that each chicken knows. <laughs> I mean, how do we explain the success of the chickens harnessing information? Well, we have to say the kernel that is in front of a given chicken is the same kernel that that same chicken will peck and the chicken that gets nourished thereby is the same chicken that does the seeing and pecking. So we as theorists need the notion of chicken identity. But or I should say hen. Why should I say I don't know. But 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 the hen doesn't really need it. And you know they in other words they don't need to realize that they can think of themselves and the information they have of themselves in the same way they think of other chickens, right? A, a, a chicken will see another chicken or a rooster will see a chicken with a kernel in front of it and it will realize that that chicken has a kernel in front of it. And then it will look at the chicken, decide how big it is. If it's not too big, it'll go chase it away and eat the kernel itself. Uh, but the rooster or the chicken don't need to think of themselves having a kernel in front of them as a special case of what they see when they see another chicken having a kernel in front of them. Uh, when do you start to need that? Well, you know, I don't know, somewhere before you go to graduate school in philosophy, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so self-knowledge, it starts off with what I call primitive self-knowledge. That is primitive self-knowledge, self-affecting, self informative states, states that carry information about the very individual that has them, and self-affecting actions, and the self-affecting states lead to the self-affecting actions. So our concept of a person grows out of that one, and, and, and so, so we, we do have, uh, you know, eventually we do form something like a filing cabinet in our mind where we have little file folders for different things and different people. Just, you know, just uh, not a serious theory. I don't think we have manila folders in our heads. But uh, um, and, and so and eventually we have one of those for ourselves. And we, we put the stuff we pick up in self-informative ways in that file. But it's, it's not required to be in a file to, uh, to, to, to do important work. Uh, remember... Uh, well, I don't know if you would remember, maybe you were too young, but George W. Bush uh, once gave a talk in um, in the Middle East during one of the wars he'd started, and uh, somebody threw a shoe at him, 
and uh, he he moved, <laughs> and the shoe didn't hit him. Well, <laughs> his his moving was not motivated by the belief that a shoe was coming at George Bush. Right. It was motivated by something like shoe coming. <laughs> right. Um, so so we 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 end up treating ourselves in the same way as other people in the sense that, you know, we have a I have a John Perry folder and you know, it's full of things. I was born in Nebraska and own a 19, uh, uh, 2003 Kia or whatever the fuck it is. And, uh, but, but that, that self folder has a special relation, uh, to me, the person that has it, it it's, 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 it's my self concept. So, so that's, that's how it connects up with the notion of the self. I don't know about personal identity i mean i mean it uh i mean memory is one of the things what i call first person memory and what Locke was talking about only doesn't make it very clear <laughs> first person memory is a self informative naturally self informative way of knowing about what happened to someone in the past uh, you know, if, if I remember someone eating, uh, whatever that shit I eat, uh, honey baked oats or something for, for breakfast, honey, honey bunches of oats, honey bunches of oats. Right. I hope it's healthy because I kind of like it. So I remember eating honey bunches of oats. Uh, I might remember my wife eating honey bunches of oats, but, um, the second thing is event memory. I remember seeing the event of her. The first is first person memory. So, so there is a connection between the self and the very kinds of memory and also the kinds of anticipation or planning or intention. Uh, they all have this uh, selfless, I know self is the right word, but um, uh, <coughs> uh this kind of odd characteristic that, that that they are beliefs about a certain person, but they do not require us having anything in our mind that stands for that person, although eventually we will. Um, so, yeah, there's a connection. I've never quite written that up, but now it always seems about right to me. So, so yeah, so self-knowledge is... Uh, is pretty unique, but I don't think unfathomable. Um, now, why do we care about ourselves more than other people? Well, lots of us don't, but there's a kind of a natural instinct uh, to be very moved by uh, pain that we see we're going to have as opposed to pain that we see someone else is going to have. And then, I don't know, the philosophers I like, you know, Hume and uh, what's his name? Adam? Adam? No. Who was the economist? The guy in Adam Smith. Adam, yeah. <laughs> I get Bob Adams, Adam Smith, I mm -hmm. Adam and Eve. At my age, it all just blurs into one. <laughs> but anyway, uh, have have to do with that overcoming that thing, getting a sympathy that motivates you uh, to treat other people uh, uh, with the prospect of pain, uh, uh, you know, with as much or almost as much uh, worry as you would if you were having the pain. What there is to ethics more than that, I've never been able to quite figure out, but I'm not saying there isn't a lot more to it, but that's all Hume can find, so it's probably all I can find. <laughs> uh, plus what Elder Strawson said, there are certain things that people do where we really resent them. Hmm. That seems important. 
But well, like, like the younger Strassen says, you really going to justify punishing people with that thin a concept? Anyway, I digress. So anyway, mm-hmm. next question. Well, the, the last thing that I wanted to talk about today is just a, I think a confused question, but a, a question that comes up a lot in ordinary discourse. And what I'm wondering is how you make philosophical sense of the question, whether you could be someone else. Like I can make the sense of, I can make sense of the idea of my brain being in someone else's body, mm-hmm. but could I really be uh, someone else? Yeah. Well, it's pretty clear we could imagine being someone else. That is, I can imagine being, who's our president? Uh, Biden. Mm -hmm. That one. I can imagine being Biden in the sense that I can imagine sitting in the Oval Office behind the whatever it is desk and uh, having people come in to me and, you know, say things and then I make decisions. I mean, I kind of, kind of, Imagine having all the experiences Biden has, uh, and, and that's kind of what we think of as imagining being Biden. But of course, is that really imagining a world, as David Lewis would put it, or a situation in which John Perry is Biden? Well, no, I mean, how would we do that? Well, it might be a lot more complicated. I mean, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe there's there was this guy called Biden, <laughs> born in Delaware or Pennsylvania, wherever he was, and then at at some point he, uh, you know, uh, had a, a terrible nervous breakdown. Or, you know, what do they call it when you have two, you know, uh, schizophrenia? And um, so, so you know, go on. So, so his, his folks decided the best way to handle it was uh, just set aside a couple hours a day in which he could be this other guy. And uh, so maybe one way or another that led to it. So <laughs> you can imagine that other guy not realizing that he really is Biden. But I mean, that's, that's not what, can you really imagine? Can I, can I imagine a situation in which uh, person A and person B, I mean, A is B and B is A, well, uh, uh, I think Lewis thought you could. Kripke thought you couldn't. Um, I guess I don't think you can. (laughs) I mean, coherent situation in which it's not, uh, I mean, I mean, on on my theory of brain brain splitting, where you end up with three people, you, maybe you could make sense of it then. Uh, but uh, that's pretty unconnected to what we ordinarily think of as imagining being someone else. What we usually mean by that is just imagining what it would be like for us to be in their situation. And then you can add more and more into their situation, and including where they were born and who their parents were and so forth and so on. Uh, uh, Kripke would say you can imagine having genes like the ones they had, but you really can't imagine having their genes because he thought the identity was in the genes. Hmm. Only if they're Levi's, though. Uh, not not cheap. <laughs> Actually, I don't know what Kripke thought because I never talked to him very much. Uh, so yeah, well, I don't know. Is that 
Is that responsive to what you were worried about? Yeah, I think so. And, well, John, we have now totally covered the gamut of identity, personal identity, uh, personhood, and the self. Uh, Thanks so much for doing this with me. Okay, but we still got uh, semantics, pragmatics, logic. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Philosophy of math. There's there's many other topics. Yeah, I have I have opinions about philosophy of math. Namely, it's a shame anybody thought it up. <laughs> but they don't go much deeper than that. Mm. All right. Well, I enjoyed it thoroughly. I hope it was okay with you. Hold on, geeslings. Before you go, please uh, like. Subscribe, follow if you haven't already. Smash all those buttons. And also, if you haven't followed me on uh, Twitter at Robinson Earhart, or if you're not <laughs> joining me every morning as I eat my pint of ice cream on Twitch at Robinson Earhart on Robinson Eats, please do so. Bye.